I'm closing out Black History Month with a very special conversation that I had with author and educator Sahai E. Farrell. We met here in Los Angeles at a Recycling Black Dollars event, and she told me all about her book. It started out as a memoir turned into a novel. I'm talking about woven into the fabric, into the very fabric of our lives. God has woven spun gold. She took me inside to to introduce me to this young student at Stanford who was given the opportunity to to compete in Miss Watts Beauty Pageant, a pageant that she won, and that winning took her to five countries in Africa. While in Ethiopia, Sahai was given the opportunity to meet Emperor Haile Selassie. And while she met with him, he was smitten. And before she left Ethiopia, she was engaged to the emperor's grandson. Well, she goes back to Watts preparing for her wedding. The unimaginable happens. The wedding never happens. And history is changed. You have to take a listen and really understand that chain of events in Sahai's wording from her eyes, from her being a part of those events. It's only fitting that I remember this dear lady who left this realm of living way too soon, I do believe, and bring to you my conversation with Sahai E. Farrell as we speak of her book, Woven into the Fabric, into every fabric of our lives, God has woven spun gold. The overarching theme is that we are to notice those precious eternal things and the people in our lives. Stay with me. Our conversation comes up in one moment. Welcome to Her Business, Her Voice, Her Conversation with Margot Levette. Heard on BashaniRadio.com and worldwide on iHeartRadio. Baby boomers reinvented to become entrepreneurs, authors, speakers. Their second act is one of courage, full of how-tos and inspiration. Now let's get into the show. Here is your host, Margot Levette. Hello, everybody. It's Marco Levette back with a brand new show, her business, her voice, her conversation. As I always promise you, I am bringing you an exceptional show, an exceptional story. Uh, we are going to take a look at the book written by Sahai S.C.B. Farrell. Let me tell you a little something about her. She is the author of Woven into the Fabric, which is a novel. And Sahai, she she's provided the inspiration for Woven into the Fabric. Uh, it's her uh, life story, sort of. And she'll tell us more about that. While she was studying at Stanford University, she won the Miss Watt beauty pageant and was sent as a goodwill ambassador ambassador to five African countries now what happens in between I'm going to leave that to Sahai nobody can talk about that like her but I will drop down and let you know that during her prior marriage to Los Angeles County Councilman Bob Farrell who is now retired they had one daughter Farrell and her daughter they hold dual citizenship in the United States and Israel. Sahai herself, she lives right here in Los Angeles. So Sahai, SCB Farrell, let me welcome you to Her Business, Her Voice, Her Conversation. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Margo. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're going to have a wonderful, awesome uh, conversation. You are going to uh, drop some nuggets on us, and people are going to say, what, what? So <laughs> before further ado, in your own way, tell us, who is the high SCB Farrell? Well, um, I'm a native of Los Angeles. I was born in L.A., raised in Watts and uh, Fremont, Gompers Junior High School, Fremont, and went on to Stanford University, where I got my bachelor's and master's. And uh, tying in with the story, I uh, when I was a junior at Stanford, I, I won the Miss Watts uh, beauty pageant, and they sent me to five African countries. And uh, that's 
the inspiration for my story because once I went to the countries, I met Emperor Haile Selassie and got connected to the Ethiopian royal family. And so I think the story probably started off as a um, a memoir, but as my writing teacher, uh, Dina Metzger, once said, you know, trust the process. The story might do anything along the way, but just trust it when it does something else. And so I did, and and it became what it is today, which is woven into the fabric, and I love the subtitle, which is into the very fabric of our lives, God has woven spun gold, and that's mm. kind of the theme of the novel is just noticing those precious eternal things and people in our lives. Wow. This, before we go any further, have you mm-hmm. always been a writer, uh, a poet? How how did you get in? How did you begin to put pen to paper? Yeah, you. Know, I think I've always written. So over the years, I've written, and I was at Stanford. I was an English major, so you know, you're just deluged with writing and reading in that in that way. Um, I do have one book that came out in 1992 called Tor: The Transformation of Race. Resolving the Internal Dilemmas, but that's a nonfiction book. So this Woven into the Fabric is my first novel, and um, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm happy to say it's a literary novel, so it has scope and depth and breadth and uh, love and magic and politics and spirit, yeah. <laughs> wow. I know it's your baby. I how I know that it's something. It is a labor of love. Mm-hmm. Will you narrow it down as to what person would be really this novel? What person should definitely pick it up because they are not going to be able to put it down. Is it someone who loves a love story? Is it someone who loves history? Mm. Who's your it ideal the- reader? It's a historical novel. It's a historical romance. It deals with a modern-day um, love story, but it also goes back into a biblical love story with Solomon and Sheba. So mm. just so I can kind of frame who might be interested, when I first had my first draft of the manuscript, I invited six women, and they were ages um, 27 to, I think, 72, and um, they read the manuscript, and we discussed it. And we discussed it for actually, I asked them to come four Tuesdays in a row from two to four. And they changed the time to two in the afternoon till six, and they extended it one day. So we <laughs> ended up doing it for 16 hours discussing the book. And basically they said, and I said, do you realize we've discussed it 16 hours? And they said, and we just scratched the surface. So I think it's going to be um, wonderful for lovers of history, people who love. There's a spiritual depth in the book um, that I think men and women will, will enjoy. I think it's lovely for young people. I was a high school English teacher and an instructional coach for teachers. And what I found, which surprised me, is and also taught at university, so whenever I would share part of my story with my students, it would generally, everybody would love it, but it would generally be the boys who stayed after class. So it's very interesting that men, it gets men's attention in a way that was unexpected to me. That That is surprising. That That really, mm-hmm. really is surprising you would assume women uh yes. queen of sheba and uh mm-hmm. your own story which we're yes. going to dig in a little bit deeper if it's okay with you but Absolutely. the men you know what i'm finding men are men are evolving as far as their thinking goes and the things that we used to think went over their head and they didn't pay they don't pay any mm-hmm. attention to they mm-hmm. kind of share the same cares and things uh, interests that a lot of women do they really do yeah. and it's really it's really very it's lovely and it's um um 
I, I'm just thinking of a man who who shared with me. I was sharing with him this part of the book where um, the son of Queen of Sheba became the first king of Ethiopia, and there was a moment between the son and the mother where, with just with their eye contact, she really like moved away from being a mother and pressed him down into his own consciousness and wisdom and, and, and stood back and said, now now you are the king, so it's on you. Mm-hmm. And and I remember I was sharing that part with a, with a friend of mine, and he just like froze. And mm-hmm. I turned around and said, what's going on? He said, you know, I was there. I watched that moment between the Queen of Sheba and her son and, and how she raised him, her last gesture as a mother. He said, and it was like for a moment I was watching it, and then the next moment she was looking in my eyes and Mm. pressing me back to my own wisdom. And he said, and it feels like now I'm more of a man than I've ever been for that moment. He said, and it also feels like, in part, it feels like I was raised by the Queen of Sheba. So. Amazing. 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 Mm, yeah, mm, mm. yeah, really. So, hi, when we look at the story, I, I want you to, well, I, I think before we actually get into the story, mm-hmm. when you were, can you give us a little background? Uh, because the story is not set here in the States, that I do want people to know. It, so, will you give oh, us a little, is, mm-hmm. part of it? Okay. Yeah, part of it is, yeah. Can you set this up for us as far as uh, your traveling to the five African countries, mm-hmm. your mm-hmm. time spent in Ethiopia? Can you kind of mm-hmm. give us, a, a, from a personal bird's eye view, uh, can you fill us in, fill in those blanks for us? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I think I'll fill it in the way it happens because it happened kind of in a magical way. So um, I was at Stanford, and actually this part is in the book, but the character in the book is Brenna. So Brenna is kind of inspired by me, but it's really not me because there are things that happen that are kind of out of the scope of what actually happened as well, but mm-hmm. that tell the story very beautifully. And so anyway, I'll I'll tell my part of the story. At Stanford, I was just walking across campus. There's a big church on campus, Memorial Church. And just in the middle of the day, the sun hit the gold on the mural above the church, and there was a glint in my eye. And I just heard a voice as as I squinted for a second. A voice said, you're going to Africa. And so uh, I've always been spiritual back as long as I could remember. And so whenever something just, comes out of the blue or seems a little odd or strange, I kind of like become aware that maybe this is guidance that I'm getting. And so I just knew Mm -hmm. in that moment I was going to Africa, did not know how. And then it turned out maybe like a year or so later, I got a anonymous letter. You know, I was at the post office and my name is not easy to spell. And the lady at the Mm -hmm. post office said, you know, is this you? And I said, perhaps is it from LA and so as a woman who she immediately said you don't know me but I've been watching you get your scholarships from Fremont to Stanford and all and I just think since you were raised and watched you make a good Miss Watts and she sent me an application and I prayed Mm -hmm. and I and I uh got into the pageant and um one of my older sisters had been an earlier Miss Watts, so I kind of felt it was community service, which is what I saw her do, and, and which I've always been about. And so that's what I imagined the the Miss Watts pageant was for me that year. But it turned out, you know, when they announced like two weeks before the pageant the prizes and they said an all-expense-paid trip to five African countries, that voice came back and said, that's your trip. So that was two years later. So that is how I got to go on the trip. And even even then, once I looked at the itinerary, you were going to meet Emperor Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. You're going to meet President Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, uh, hmm. the head of state in Tanzania, Nigeria, and Ghana. And there were all these, there were balls and all these fancy occasions. And I was telling Bonnie, who was over the prizes, you know, 
I don't have clothes for look at all these things. And so she said, you haven't looked at all your prizes. And one of the prizes she showed me that Disneyland costume department was making my wardrobe for the trip. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I knew it was I knew it was a magical opening here. I just felt that it was a magical opening, not knowing what it would be, but I already knew. I think there's a chapter in the book called Before You Ask. And that's kind of the spirit of what was happening before I was getting ready to say, but I need, it was already done. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How did you feel to meet all of these heads of state, these rulers, and, and, and how did that feel? I mean, when you, oh, my goodness, I just can't imagine. I don't even know the question to ask. It was, you, you know, was it, I had... It was glorious, and and it was. Um, I had two companions that travel with me, and mm-hmm. um, two other women, and you know, first of all, it was just a feeling like um, they sent me to Africa as a trip because of our sense of community. Remember, this is it, like in. Um, the early 70s and in, in the whole okay. black culture, black power movement. And so they decided, like, why just take white people's opinion of what Africans feel about us and vice versa? Let's send Miss Watts to Africa and let her come back and tell us what was the, what's the real deal. And so when, you know, we arrived, Ethiopia was the first country, and I didn't know what to expect, but I know after we land and we got off the plane, there was just a feeling of, in me, of home. It mm-hmm. felt like a sense of home that I'd never felt before, and, and it wasn't anything I had expected. And it felt like um, we had returned, that our ancestors mm-hmm. had been taken from this land, and we had returned and it it mattered it meant something it felt it felt great and meeting Haley Selassie um well it was kind of interesting because it was very interesting first of all he lives in a palace he lives in the jubilee palace and it's a huge palace unexpected i didn't expect palaces in africa i just had not even thought of it and we were given one of his daughters, uh, Princess, gave us traditional Ethiopian clothes to wear. And, um, you know, we went to meet him, and um, they showed us how the protocol curtsy, how to curtsy, how to address him, and the protocols for meeting an emperor. And then when they came to get us to enter into uh the I'm assuming the throne room because there's a throne. His throne is in that room. Uh, when they came to get us, and it was three of us, they said, no, and my maiden name is Hayes. Um, he would like to see Miss Hayes by herself first. Mm. So that was really uh, surprising for me. But our host on the ground, Dr. Talbert, said, go right ahead. So I went and uh we just, it felt like, he felt familiar to me in a way that was completely, again, unexpected. And then mm-hmm. we, he was standing there in front of his throne, and then he called somebody to bring a seat. I sat down, he sat down, and we just chatted for quite a while. And I'll just say one more thing about the meeting with him, because you asked how it felt. At, mm-hmm. at a point, he asked me, you know, where are your people from? And I said, Arkansas, Texas. Uh, and he said, I mean, you know, where in Africa? And I wow. said, well, Your Majesty, you know, with the slave trade and things like that, we don't know for sure. And then he leaned forward and just looked me in the eyes and said, I know where you're from. You're from the royal lineage of the house of Judah, my house, and I know my own anywhere. Wow. And we just have to make the adjustment, so... I'm going to stop there because it actually stopped me in my tracks. <laughs> yeah, that's Yeah, it stopped that. me in my tracks. Oh wow. Amazing. Yeah. Mhm. Simply amazing. Yeah. Mm. So so I I can't wait to read if that yeah, I mean, you are really oh my goodness, the yeah. protocol, the the yeah. I mean, you just didn't go busting up in there. You didn't go in there just 
doing no. LA style, you know. No, no, like, no, no. They no, they treat you they teach you how you are to treat their their king and mm-hmm. uh and out of respect, of course, you follow their protocol. And mm-hmm. then it went beyond the protocol because he ended up introducing me when he said to make the adjustment, I think it came in the form of an introduction to one of his grandsons who was a prince. And um, you'll see the love story. I mean, we ended up being, you know, engaged, and there's a whole part of that in Brenna's story and Brianna's story in the novel. Oh, which wait is a minute. On, yeah. So in re- hold up, hold up. In, <laughs> so in real life, in when real he was life. making the adjustment, yes, you were engaged to the emperor's grandson. Yes. Yes. So when he made how and how he made the adjustment was, you know, we were leaving and then, you know, he had given us gifts. And then when Mm. we were leaving, we were making our exit because eventually I remembered after about a half hour of talking with him by myself, I remembered my companions and we came in and exchanged gifts. And then we were leaving and then he called me back and I went Mm. back. And so he said, I have a surprise for you. And I said, Your Majesty, you gave me this bracelet. The country, you've given me some. He says, no, it's someone to meet. And uh, he says, so tomorrow morning you'll get a new itinerary at your hotel. And uh, I said, well, who? Like, you know, tell me who. And he said, "It's it's a surprise. He said, so, but you'll like them. And I said, well, Your Majesty, I really like you so much. I, I know I will. And he says, no, afterward you have to give me a report. Wow. So. So the next day, I saw the itinerary was altered, and uh, it included meeting with his grandson. And, uh, uh, you know, when I met him, it just felt like, oh, my gosh. (laughs) He was so handsome, and uh, he was so... Uh, he just felt familiar. Well, quite frankly, my my sense of it at the moment that when I first met him, I felt he was mine. <laughs> Girl, go that, ahead. Mm. That's what I felt. I felt he was mine. I didn't know why I felt that, but I felt he was mine. <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 So, at any rate, the story take it goes it proceeds throughout really kind of you know the rest of our lives in in its own way and um yeah so it's it's been how um god weaves things together you really don't ever know Mm -hmm. you know um because in real life it turned out that my husband that i married here you know was was a a councilman and he was Mm -hmm. involved with trans africa and when some Ethiopians approached me and asked me to have my husband help, because after the coup in Ethiopia, a lot of them came here in the early 80s, in the well, in the late 70s, early 80s. At any rate, so um, I said, of course, I'll, I'll ask him to help. And when he helped, his help came in the form of uh, Trans Africa and Randall Robinson and Maxine Waters and the whole group mm-hmm. of them, Harry Belafonte. They got from President Carter unofficial asylum for all the Ethiopians in America. Wow. So you see how that little thing dovetailed, uh, that relationship made them approach me, and it just so happens that my husband, you know, was in a position to help influence that decision. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people don't know that in real life, as we see all the Ethiopians here in America, that they were all about to be deported except wow. for a black organization you know lobbied on their behalf to the president and got asylum for them so um wow. yeah woven yep. into the fabric woven into, into the very the fabric fast. of our lives Woo. god yeah, is you you are fun goal there's gold yeah. in our life. There's these strands that are beyond, you know, I think a lot that many of us focus on just the common everyday life without paying attention to that inner guidance that we're getting because sometimes it seems strange, it seems 
unconnected to anything and we just think we just dismiss it but mm-hmm. if we listen and we follow those strange little paths those strange little strands i mean miraculous things uh are there for us in our lives but we just have mm-hmm. to have some courage you know to listen and and follow and and have some courage have some faith and courage in in um your own life guidance so hi do you i'm I'm listening to what you're saying. I mm-hmm. think that i I want to make sure that I hear what I'm thinking. Do you think that it's possible that while we're following these threads, these yes. threads in in the end will lead us to our purpose, our life's work if we're listening, if we're actually following the fabric, the lines of Ab- the fabric? Absolutely, I think so. I, and I think that it's, it's the uh, responsibility, the onus is on each of us to start to listen because there's a lot of voices sometimes inside. You know, your your heart might be saying, your emotions might be saying some, your mind might be saying, your history, other people's opinion. There's a lot going on inside of each one of us. So it's mm-hmm. our job to have some quiet time have some prayerful time, meditative time, where we learn how to listen to the voice of our inner guidance, uh, the voice of spirit, the voice of God in you, guiding you. And yeah. and then not only do you listen for it, but then I remember in my early years when I was a, a much younger um, a girl, really, I was kind of aware of this spiritual guidance, but I didn't know which voice to follow. And so mm-hmm. I just, I try to experiment with myself and I just said, okay, well, let me, I think this might be some guidance. So let me take a few steps in the direction of that guidance. And then mm-hmm. I discovered that if it is a part of my true guidance, then help would come. So things would start happening and it would like, uh, the bones would put on flesh, so to speak. And so help yes. would come, unexpected things would help. Now, if I took a step in the direction of what I may have thought was guidance, and I took a few steps in a direction, and nothing happened, and I take a couple a little more, and nothing happened, then I would know that, you know, this is probably just me. Because on that road, it was like, you can do this, but it's going to be just you. It'll be your own energy, your own doing of everything it's not much help on this road so for me that became one of the things that i've always used as a guide as i was learning to discern this inner voice and separate it from the others Um, i would just take a few steps in that direction cautious aware looking out looking to see what happens and then if it was fruitful and help came i would continue if I just knew I was on my own after so many steps toward that, I would just mm-hmm. kind of leave that one alone. Unless I really wanted to do it, then I would do it anyway. But I would know that this not this is not going to lead me to one of those magical type of moments that I had even you know experienced as a as a young girl. So oh, yeah. um, and this book is one of those journeys, you know mm-hmm. that. Um, I I knew was a a spiritual journey once I started writing it. And the word that I got from spirit is finish the book because the book is the bridge to the rest of your life. Mm. And I I knew I had to finish that book because there was no way that I was going to live out a life and not, you know, create the bridge that I had to cross to get to the rest of it that spirit Mm -hmm. intended. And mm-hmm. so it's it's a 21 year journey. I oh, I started wow. the book in uh, 1996, and it's taken 21 years. So it's when it's born <laughs> now, uh, it's born grown. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. But so much wisdom and the yeah. the fab the gold that is spun into the fabric. The, the, oh, yeah. the veins and so. Yes. Will, will you take? I know that we are running out of time here, but the book title no. is. Well, I know, but you see, you're going to have to come, you're going to have to come back because I will. We are. Uh, this conversation is coming up early uh, into your the launch of your book. I want yes. to have you come back because I want you to just 
talk to us about how it has been received and some okay. of the responses from other people. So that we're going to definitely, to. yeah, we're going to follow this up. But mm-hmm. real quick, just so that everybody's clear, uh, the title of the, of the book is woven into the fabric, into the very fabric of our lives. God has woven spun gold. Now, I know yes. you have a book description here, 200 words. Just in a nutshell, can you just can you just kind of give us a flavor and a feel for the book shorter than 200 words? Yeah, so let you, me just look let me let me just share a couple of these cuz it's okay. so there are two women separated by a thousands of years cuz there's the Queen of Sheba and there's a young beauty queen from Watts. And um Queen of Sheba was born in an age when there were miracles were expected and mm-hmm. her journey begins uh when she first hears about King Solomon from her merchant who has traveled but also gathered stories and there's just something about it she's is he's describing this man of wisdom in Israel mm-hmm. in uh in Jerusalem that her spirit says you're to go up to Jerusalem and she does and so you know she tells her chief of merchants Tamron that after you know he and and his men have rested for several months then they will prepare a royal caravan because she will go up to Jerusalem and so for her that put her on an exquisite path that eventually joined Ethiopia and Israel in such a way that the family of Haile Selassie is a descendant of the first king of Ethiopia which was the son of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And yeah. so inside the Ethiopian, not only royal family, but the legacy of the people is this deeply embedded Judaic tradition. Because mm-hmm. at one point, they were the southernmost house of Israel under King Solomon and with Queen Makeda as the queen. And so, you know, um, Brenna, the modern day young woman, you know, when she goes and she meets the emperor and she meets his grandson, that meeting becomes a life path for her as well. And so uh, we're introduced to them. And Makeda, the queen of Sheba, her name is Makeda. Uh, Makeda is also a woman who is in tune to inner guidance and spirit. You know, as queen, we get we have a little picture into her life when um, her mother first turned the queenship over to her. But we also see that that queenship is a spiritual thing, that throughout the years of training, there were things that she had to, her spirit had to grow to be able to house the wisdom that was necessary to rule a people. So... Mm-hmm. So we have wow. both of these both of these stories uh and I think I like how it says on the back of my book it says it's a lyrical tale of magical realism woven into the fabric explores a world where reality and the miraculous intersect. Mm. I think that says it all. <laughs> yeah. That really does. This is a magical piece. Just your story uh, the way you set it up, and uh, Brenna, I can only imagine how glorious it is to yeah. go dig deeper with her journey. Sahai, SCB, Farrell, thank you so much for giving us this uh, conver- giving me this conversation, spending this wonderful time with me. Much mm. appreciated, and thank you. Twenty one years of just yes. <laughs> get it, building up to write the story. Such yeah, a vital yeah. piece. I am I am so grateful to be on the show. You're my first show um as my book is being released now, you're my first show so people can find it on amazon.com. It's called Woven into the Fabric. And um I hope they love it. I think I wrote to the reader, you know, that if you're reading this book and you find that you love it, know that the book is loving you back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it is. Well, I tell you what, um, at this taping, we haven't, you haven't had your launch yet, 
but that's coming up. So I definitely will be at the baby shower. And yes. And goodness, I can't <laughs> wait. I'm getting my signed copy then. And, oh, my goodness, much success to you. And I'm so I'm so glad for you. I am happy, happy, happy for you. I you have every so reason much. to be excited. Not a thank problem. Thank you, and I thank you for your uh, enthusiasm about the book and uh, for uh, inviting me to the show. And I definitely would love to come back and share with you what has what will have unfolded as the book is received by people and they share back with me their experiences. Yes. Well, we have a deal on that. That's, that would definitely happen. But the time has gone down on us, okay. and All I have right. to thank the listening audience. Thank you for listening. And I always advocate, don't listen once, listen again, because my guests, are, are they just spill the beans, and yeah. there's always so much to learn. And um, uh, everybody has their tale that is spun with gold. So it's a high SCB Farrell. Yes. Thank you. And I'm Margot Levette. I'll be back next week, next Thursday, with a brand new show. Thanks for listening, and until next time, I have to say, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Her Business, Her Voice, Her Conversation with Margot Levette. Since you liked what you heard, go over to HerBusinessHerVoice.com to get a copy of her book, updates, and show notes. Be sure to let family, friends, and colleagues know about the show. Margot returns next week with a brand new dialogue on Her Business, Her Voice, Her Conversation. Thanks for listening to Her Business, Her Voice, Her Conversation. Remember, our parent company, Go Beyond the Interview. You ready to imagine, build, and launch your own podcast? Let's do it. How about podcast guesting? Placement, one sheet, everything. We can help you with that also. Visit us, gobeyondtheinterview.com. Remember, Her Business, Her Voice, Her Conversation will be back in two weeks. In the meantime... Take care. We'll see you next time.